I had the great opportunity, as you heard, to showing up at the right time uh, and had the opportunity to be part of this um, uh, beautiful company called Skype. Um, I also had the great opportunity to um, invest in a lot of companies. So I'm a serial entrepreneur, author, investor. Um, and I've started more than like 50 different companies. I, I started a company called uh, Player.io, uh, Kenetworks, and um, Nunuba. I sold all of these companies to Yahoo. So if you're an entrepreneur having a company that doesn't work out, call Yahoo. <laughs> because they buy everything with some persuasion. Uh, I also invested over 400 million euros into a company called Salando. I don't think you know it, but it's basically the equivalent of ASOS here in the UK. Uh, anyone know Salando? Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, there's a lot of Europeans, of course. So um, it was a small company, and I invested 400 million euros. And, you know, I would say, you know, the stock owners were not very pleased. I spent quite a lot of time here in the UK trying to explain why selling shoes on the internet was a good idea. But most of the investors here basically said, you know, every smart human being understands that you need to try on the shoes before you buy them. This is a very stupid idea. Uh, but it turned out to be okay anyway. <laughs> I was also the chairman of the board of a company called iCloud. Uh, which was actually purchased by Apple. Uh, no one really believed in you know, having things on a server. You know, everybody wanted to rack things in the basements, but uh, um, I believed in it, and um, very, very luckily, one day Apple calls and uh, wants to buy it. I'm also in the board of um, uh, IKEA, which I'm now helping to transform and rethink their perspectives. But as you heard and, and hear, my life has always been, how do you change the game? How do you disrupt the existing? How can you take a perfectly working business model and destroy it? That's why I get out of bed every morning. That's what enjoys me. What can you destroy? I don't know how many of you like that idea, but I really strive by it. And then, um, if this would be a normal lecture, I'd be spending most of my time talking about my successes, but I'm not. I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes talking about all my failures. And if again, in normal lecture, I'd be standing here talking to you. But let's flip coin this around. You know, we have some really good leaders here. Um, please interrupt me, say I'm wrong, let's get the dialogue going. I often have very, very strong opinions about things I have no clue about. <laughs> I don't know if that's just me. But let's see if we can get the dialogue going. But maybe we could start with the first question. Is it the big that beat the small? Or is it the fast that beat the slow? Anyone? Fast. Fast. Matthew? Fast. fast. Okay, is that correct? Hands up for fast. Okay. Okay, let's hands up for the big that beat the small. Two, three hands, some coming up. Yeah, I think for me this was actually a trick question because in most of the successes I've had, the fast beat the slow. But in the failures, which are quite numerous, it was actually the big that beat me. I couldn't actually surpass them. I couldn't get up to speed because they killed me. Why was that? So I was super puzzled. But I had the great opportunity after we sold Skype um, to start lecturing at Stanford. If you ever have time, uh, go there. It's a beautiful place. And uh, it was a dream, so I went. But after a while, my... Um, Professor Tom Kosnick, he came up to me and said, Jonas, you know, the students love you, you're doing a great job, you're very provocative. Um, there's only one little thing. Would you, would you be interested in some feedback? <laughs> I don't know how it is with you, but when I hear the word feedback, it's never positive. It's like, yeah, maybe you should give the faculty some feedback, that would be good. But then you're like, of course, I'd be super happy with feedback, so, um, but it's a lie. And like, okay, what's on your mind? Yeah, well, you know, you're doing a really good job, so we just want to have that said. But from the faculty side, we have noticed that you haven't read the literature you're lecturing about. 
okay, fair point, you know. <laughs> I can see that, you know. Um, I read, you know, the first chapter and the last chapter, thought I could get away with it. I don't know, how many here have read American management literature? Hands up. No one? Not a lot of people. Well, the others who haven't read anything, you haven't missed anything. Most of these books are actually shit boring. <laughs> it's like you have one theory, it's like 500 pages, you read the first chapter, you get it. That's what I thought, I, you know, get along with it. But I had to read all of these books page by page. But I came to the same conclusion. These books are shit boring. So I went to Tom and I said, Tom, why don't you write a book or we write a book about all the knowledge that you've had at Harvard, then you take into Stanford, you touch some of the most interesting entrepreneurs in this world. Why don't we write a book together? And he said, that's a good idea. And I think he was envisioning, you know, this big Bible of knowledge. But I said, if I want to do it together, Tom, I want to do it my way. I said, if I want to write a book, I want to write a book that is a, 100 pages long, and half has to be pictures. I'll tell you, he was not utterly convinced. <laughs> but I said, you know, this is what the world needs. You know, everyone can read, you know, normal management literature. So we set off, we wrote the book, and then we were super proud. And we printed 30 copies, and we sent it to his former colleagues at Harvard. What do you think they said when they saw this book? Anyone? Like. Either brilliant, or brilliant or bad. Yeah, well, I think they said, like, oh, Tom, this is so sweet. <laughs> You've written a children's book. And like, Tom was totally devastated. So you have to cancel it, you know, it doesn't work. And, and the academics on the other side was like, well, it's, it, don't be shy, Tom. It's, it's probably really well suited for the West Coast. <laughs> but here at the East Coast, we have a bit higher academic standards. So, you know, Tom was devastated. He said, you know, we have to cancel the book. You know, we can't do it. It's my reputation, all the fear. And I was like, Tom. Let's be honest, who really cares about 30 professors at Harvard? They just don't understand my brilliance, Tom. <laughs> it happens all the time. Trust me, this is going to be all right. Let's go talk to the big publishers in the world. So I went around and I met all the biggest publishing houses. What do you think they said when they saw this book? Anyone? Cute little book, yes, children's departments down the hall. Well, that's basically what they said. They re most of them actually sent home really formal letters that you open and you, you get in your mailbox and you open them and say, Dear Mr. Kjellberg, we wish you great success somewhere else. <laughs> what do you do with that kind of information? It's basically, fuck off. <laughs> we don't like it. Okay, I get that part. Um, so it was turned down everywhere. And I said, okay, how hard can it be to print a book? You know, I started a lot of companies, you print it on paper and you, you start selling it. So I did. And since I was pissed with the whole industry, <laughs> I went back and I wrote another book. <laughs> Business creation. And this has only pictures. <laughs> they said, fuck you all. <laughs> Now there's a third book published by Wiley here in the UK, one of the most prestigious in publishing houses. Why would they call back and change their mind? Anyone? It sold a lot of copies. Yes, and when that happens, apparently you're willing to change your academic standards. It's very interesting, isn't it? So, what's the book about? Well, the book is about the nine gears that you need to be successful. And I think in the center part here is actually customer acquisition. How do you actually drive sales? <clears throat> and this is where my, my journey started. I actually had the opportunity to become the CEO assistant of a company called the Kinevi Group, which I actually later came back and did all the investments for. But as a CEO assistant, you cook coffee, you repark cars, you do a shitload of PowerPoints. We bought a couple of companies and we sold a couple of companies. And what's still tradition today is that after this first year, you become the CEO of a subsidiary. Felt very natural for me, you know, double degree. Spent one year with top management. Of course, I should become the CEO of a new company. So, 
You're all leaders. What's the first thing you do when you become an assigned a new boss for something? Anyone? You could do nothing, you know, that works quite well. You're all HR people. What's the first thing we do? What did we learn at school? What do you need? A strategy, yeah? And here I could excel. I could sit in my corner office and I could do hundreds of thousands of PowerPoints. But this is where it really hit me. Have you ever thought how easy it is to add customers in Excel? It's a brilliant tool, huh? But um, things weren't really working out. So I couldn't really figure this out. So since I studied both technology and economy at the same time, I thought I must have missed that lecture about sales. So I went back to all my management books, and I found this model in nearly all books. It must be shit important, because it's in a lot of books. What model is it? Anyone? The BCG growth share matrix. Yeah, do you think I got, you know, the, the star company? Of course not. Do you think I got a company that made money? No. I got the dog. What do you do with the dog in this model? You kill it, you divest. Thank you, BCG, that didn't really help me. I was stuck being the dog. So, but luckily I found A Acres SWOT model. How many has done a SWOT model? Great, let's put Jonas Kelberg in here. 30 years ago, what comes out? A lot of weaknesses. Still pride predominantly. So I'm starting to panic. This company's not you know, taking off, and I have basically nowhere to turn to. So it ended actually up, I called my father. And he was very surprised. He said, Jonas, you've never ever asked for advice ever before. You must be in a really shitty position before you called me, yeah? You've always got it all figured out, haven't you? Yeah, it seems to be the only thing, you know, management boards care about is actually sales and have no clue how to run it. So he said, okay, I have an old friend of mine who started as a sales guy, he's now the CEO. He was the CEO for NCR, one of the largest corporates in the US. And he said, he's coming over to our house in the next two weeks. You should come over and meet him. I'm like super excited to meet this like super CEO, get all the knowledge. And when we meet, the only thing he gives me is a small brochure that says, Hundra knack, tio snack, ett tack från en framgångsrik Electrolux försäljare. That's in Swedish. You need to knock on a hundred doors. You need to talk to one, ten people before you get one yes from a famous vacuum sales clean guy. And I'm like, what? What does this have to do? I'm the CEO. I do the difficult shit, you know. He said, read it. You'll figure it out. So I did an engineering degree. So I thought about it. You do hundred. Some people, you get one yes. You do 200, you sell more. It's not complicated. It's maths. It's actually super simple. We can make it a bit more complicated talking about how do you increase frequency. And I think this is one of the main perspectives, is that how do you unlock sales? Because if you want to be disruptive today, you want to rethink, many of the successful companies I've been part of have rethought customer acquisition and they've innovated beyond. This is one of the most important perspectives. And for me, it was just maths. And it's still just maths. I ran a telco company. So we said, okay, how do we reach four million Swedish households? by running up and down stairs. So we started running up and down stairs, knocking on doors, you know, just getting the frequency up. It was a bit slow, so I said, what could we do instead? We came to the conclusion, what happens if we call everyone? So we had some operators. Problem is, you know, dialing everything was a bit slow, so we said, okay, how do we increase frequency? You know, we played around a lot with computers, and Atari said, okay, what happens if we connect the computer to the switchboard? And then let's have this computer call 10 phones at the same time, because when someone answers, we'll just connect the call and we increase frequency. 
The other problem is that if you want to call all these households, you have to buy a lot of phone numbers from British Telecom or Vodafone, and they're very expensive. So we said, okay, what happens if we call all number combinations available? The problem here is that the operators complained a lot about this tactics. But the beauty here is that the computer never complained. Until we one day we call this red phone at Muske Naval Base outside Stockholm. <laughs> and this red phone is only used for the Prime Minister. So it's like, yes, this is Överste Jansson. What can I do for you, Prime Minister? Yes, this is from Optimal Telecom. Would you be happy to buy some cheap telephony? <laughs> Later that same day, I was picked up by the Swedish secret police, Säpo. <laughs> And I was locked in for 36 hours before I could convince them I was not a Russian spy. I was just a new managing director that tried to figure out sales, connected computer to the public network. But I could also, with very clear certainty, tell them if they had more red phones connected to the public network, we would be calling them as well, offering cheap telephony. But I think this is just one example how computer power has rethought, you know, running frequency. If I look at what's happening today, I would say one of the most disruptive places is going to be how you use data and how you use customer acquisition by doing machines, because it would drastically change everything. We're so focused on things. So for me, this was great. I just kept on doing, you know, sales. I started a new company called Campus Mobile, sold that to Vodafone, started another one, and Mobison listed that. You know, my life was great. My life was all about frequency. Then I get a call from a headhunter that asked me if I want to become the CEO of a company called Lycos. How many remember the company Lycos? Yeah. What was it? It was the world's second largest search engine. The headhunter, she was a bit, you know, confused. She said, you've never made any mistakes. Everything has been, you know, super progress. You know, I like to see that you had some, you know, failures in, in, your, um, in your resume. But, you know, we got on and I got the job. But what basically do you think happened basically the same day I started there? Another little shitty company was founded. Google. So now if you're in the board of Bertelsmann and Telefonica, what do you do when a little shitty company is founded? Correct, nothing. And when you've done nothing for a while, what do you do then? Then you start making fun of the company. How will they ever survive? They don't even have a business model. Then the board panicked. We sent over our biggest, you know, most prominent German m and team, what do you think they came back with? Should we buy it? I think their recommendation was very clear. You know, it's burning through cash, it's not making money, does not have a business model, of course we should not buy it. Because Google talked about always delighting the shareholder, and this was something totally new for me. My life had always been always delight the shareholder myself. But things were not working out really well, so in the end, I went to the chairman of the board, Christoph Mohn, and I said, Christoph, we need to think outside the box here, because what they're doing, they're killing us. And then he just looked at me and said, Jonas, there is a reason we have the box. And that is because you should be inside the box and not outside the box. <laughs> Otherwise, we would not have the box. <laughs> Stupid me, of course. <laughs> So when Google said that content is king, I said sales is King Kong, and I just pushed my frequency sales throttles. How do you think it went? You think it was a success? No. It was an epic failure. Epic. Company was listed at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. It was a disaster. So in the end, I called back to the HR person and um, the headhunter and said, you know, you were worried about I didn't have any failures. Now I have quite one big one on my resume. And she said, that's not the failure. That's a career-ending move. 
We will never be able to work with you again. You know, when I was talking about failure, I was thinking you come like you wanted to win the Olympics, you end up fifth. That's a failure for me. You know, this is a career ending thing. But the interesting thing is Google did something which was delight. We've taken the word delight from the hierarchy of customer needs. How many here know Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Hands up. Basically, it works the same way. In the top, you have delight. The bottom, you have efficiency. In the end, you have functionality. I can give you an example. Um, Alfa Romeo has always had design as their delight. The problem here is the car doesn't go from A to B. <laughs> the delight falls, huh? Any Alfa Romeo owners in here? Ah, oh, beautiful. It's a beautiful car, huh? It's magical. <laughs> it's just one little problem. It doesn't work. <laughs> I can give you another example. Volvo had a strong delight. What was it? Safety. What is it today? Chinese, Scandinavian design, yeah. So here's the challenge. During the period of time, the Volvo engineers, the Swedish engineers, the brilliant people, they added enough safety features and customer satisfaction increased. But what do you think happens when all cars are as safe? It becomes a functionality. And the Swedish engineers couldn't figure it out. They had to sell the company to the Chinese. The Chinese came back and said, no, it's Scandinavian design, which is our delight, and they just carried on. And the company is doing okay today. We don't like to talk about that in Sweden. It's like our Nokia moment, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing. As you heard, I, I work for the Boston Consulting Group, so I, have a, I spend a lot of time in front of the biggest boards in the world. And I'm so surprised that most of their time they spend on defining efficiency and functionality. Why is that? When I go to startup events, it's all about innovating tomorrow's delight. Why is it so difficult for the most successful boards to rethink their business? Because defining your delight is difficult. I can give you an example. Harley Davids had enormous problems during the 80s. You know, they got a lot of company, competition from the Japanese. Cheaper, better, faster. But Harley Davidson went into chapter 11. So the management needed to find out, okay, what do we do? They went away, spent a weekend trying, okay, we need to nail it or we're dead. And what they came up with that day but still stands is what we sell is the ability for a 43-year-old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small towns and have people be afraid of him. And this is our innovation intent. It's nothing about running a motorcycle from A to B. It's about being an outlaw 30 minutes a weekend. It's very simple to figure it out, but in the end, it's all about that friction-free storytelling. What's your company about? So when I'm in the front of the boards, I only ask one question, very simple. I stress this a lot of my colleagues out, but it's very simple. What are you selling? How often do you think I get a straight answer? It's like, oh, well, Jonas, you know, it's very complicated. We have 30,000, 300,000 people in the company, you know. We have a lot of things going on. It's like, yeah, but if you're 30 people around this table don't know what you're selling, how should the rest 300,000 know what they should be doing? I had the opportunity to have Stefan Passion, one of the founders in, uh, from H&M, in my board. And he talked very passionately. It took him 10 years to figure out his delight of confusion, trying to understand, until he one day wakes up and says, okay, from today on, we're going to be a fashion company with a zero less on the price tag. If Prada can be on Fifth Avenue, so can we. If Gucci can have supermodels, so do we. If Yves Saint Laurent will take $300 pair dollars for a pair of jeans, we'll take 30. But from today on, we're going to be a fashion company. We're going to act like one. We're going to have a zero less on the price tag. 
everyone in the organization could understand it, the consumers understood it, and it has been a success journey from being a little shitty company in Sweden to now being a global giant. And this is their stock price. Then comes another company founded a couple of years later that actually has overtaken H&M. Which one? Sara, Inditex. Huh? They don't even see themselves as a fashion company. They see themselves as a logistic company. They're first with the latest. When H&M worked really hard in trying to you know, make the supply chain cheaper, they said, no, let's increase the cost for supply chain so we can be more rapid of having things that we see on a catwalk we can have in stores in three weeks. Then I invested 400 million euros into Zalando. That has overtaken. Now Zalando is 50% of H&M's stock price. And their delight is we dress code. And when I was in the board of Salando, you know, in the beginning, everything we did was unproportionately ugly. And I was like, you know, hey, let's see if we're a fashion company. Can't we make it a little bit be more beautiful homepage? And then the head of fashion, who was from BCG, just looked at me and said, Jonas, never ever underestimate the bad tastes of Germans. Because for her, everything was just an Excel sheet. What kind of products were you looking to buy? It was all about propensity models, trend models, all about trying to understand what are you going to buy based on your behavior. It's a tech play. And then you can say, okay, it's an interesting example, but if you put this example, if you look at H&M, when Zalando has increased their stock price, H&M's stock price has dropped with 50% the last two years. And they must think, ah, they must be doing really, really bad. But the interesting thing, their profits and earnings are still climbing the same. But the market doesn't believe that they can enable change. So it's not only about profit, it's not only about profitability, it's about the vision of actually rethinking things. It's basically, what is your future delight? Okay, we talked about frequency, we talked about the light. Unfortunately, in this world, you need a business model. I've tried a lot of companies that doesn't have a business model, but over time, you need one. You can put it in a more elegant wrapping, you can talk about growth, product market fit, business model innovation. But, as you know, I was just, you know, person non grata. After this epic failure, I called some old friends that I worked with earlier, and Niklas and Jonas had just started playing around with the technology, um, and I came on board. And then the first thing is like, okay, how do we price this service? It's a telco service, we did it before, you know. And they said, okay, let's just look at the prices of other international calls. I said, okay, this is how prices have gone from British Telecom, constantly down. So if we should gonna be rational, We need to price this at zero. And everyone is the, in the team is like, who brought this idiot along? <laughs> They're like, stupid, how are we gonna make money on us? I don't know, I don't have a clue. We'll just have to figure it out later, you know. And Nicholas is like, yeah, let's, you know, give, let's give this guy a chance. You know, recruitment is hard today, you know. <laughs> it's difficult, you know, we had to do with the leftovers and we, we, we got one, you know. So, um, but I think he's on to something. If this is true, we need to price it at zero. If we are able to do that, we maybe need to rethink everything. So we started the innovation in zero games. If we would be able to present this cost for zero, we needed to rethink things. So we said, okay, let's start doing that. So we started comparing. Okay, we need to do things different. This is a telco. This was Skype. A telco invests in a lot of infrastructure. We didn't have that money, so we said, okay, let's use the internet that you were already paying for. We found our first zero. Second thing, the telco buys Ericsson switches or Nokia switches. We said, okay, 
The interesting thing here is that the CPU power is actually the same in an Ericsson switch as a personal computer. We said, okay, let's use that processing power to call the calls in your computer. We found another zero. To be able to drive good voice quality around the world, we need a lot of servers everywhere, Cisco servers. By the way, how many here actually use Skype? Cool. How many use Skype before Microsoft destroyed the product? <laughs> that's a lot of people. Oh, that's cool. Um, do you remember when you had great internet, you had a good computer, you left your computer on for three hours, went, had a coffee, came back, and your computer was, your fan was on max, and your computer was super hot? Remember it? Yes. Mm. What had happened then is that your computer had become a super node and all traffic was routed through your computer. Because we came to the conclusion there was a lot of CPU power not being used connected to good internet. So we said, sharing is caring. And we used your computer. You know, there's a lot of you know, government building, big banks that are not utilizing their computers. You know, the IT department complained a bit, but no one really understood why, because the product was great. So found another zero. Then you have customer service. And I knew customer service could be very expensive. My problem was, though, I was often more pissed after I talked to Vodafone's customer service than before. And we had all the same experience. We were happy, we called, we were sad. <laughs> so the only logical thing there to do is that there is a negative delta by having a customer service. So we said, let's make it impossible to call Skype. <laughs> let's just take away our phone numbers. You know, let's place the company in Luxembourg. Let's make it impossible to call us. We didn't know by then, but there's a positive side effect to this as well, is that you know, the regulatory guys don't know where to call, you know, the tax authorities don't know who to call, so you know, but that wasn't part of the plan, it just happened out to be a positive side effect. Then, you have advertising, you know, the big Vodafones, British Telecom, they love doing TV advertising. We didn't have that kind of money. So we said, okay, how do we figure this one out? Because let's remember, if there's only a few people having Skype, it's quite a useless service. It's like an inverted network effect. Everyone talks about the network effect, but try it without it. This, this doesn't really work out very well. So, so how do we get past this? We said, okay, what happens if we make a little pop-up button that comes up after placing a good call? And it said, would you like to recommend Skype? And if you clicked on that button, since it was a downloadable client, we went in and we opened your inbox and we sent a mail to all of your contacts. And the beauty is, you sent the mail. So the opening frequency was really well received. We sent quite a lot of mails. We found another zero. And then maybe you're all thinking, okay, but this is madness. You can't do this. But if you go back to Tom Kosnick's research at Harvard, innovating in zeros is one of the main objectives for all the successful companies. It's about innovating in zeros on their cost side. Think about it. Which companies have done this really successful? Airbnb, very good example, has no cost for hotel rooms now larger than Hilton. Any more companies that have done this? Uber, same thing. No drivers, no cars. Valued at 65 billion US, you think they must have a lot of cars on their balance sheets. It's a goddamn app. What about Facebook? No cost for journalism. You are their journalism. Facebook, Google. Google every night goes out and crawls all the web, takes all the content they can find, download it onto their servers, and then they sell advertising on someone else's content. How did they get away with it? Apple, 
Because if you have a strong delight, you can also increase your price by zero. So I think they've done that. But what about their app store? They have no cost of development for apps, and they take 30% of the profit. All of these companies have innovated in zeros and rethought the game and been super successful. So it's one of the most important things. So as you hear, my life is innovate, don't imitate. This is really difficult. Because I think you need to decide in your company how you recruit is, do you recruit game changers that think differently, that are willing to go to the edge of the uncertainty to redefine the company? Or are you just recruiting outperformers? There's nothing wrong with having outperformers, but they will play a totally different game. Are you recruiting outperformers? Or do you need to change and recruit game changers? I don't know. It's up to you. But I would think the biggest challenge here, when I talk to all the outperformers, all the great guys in suits, they have it all figured out. When I spend time with my friends and the ones who are building companies, the game changers, you know, things as fear, I don't know what I'm doing, you know. Will this ever work out? You know, are we pissing away someone else's money? I'm afraid. All of these are feelings that come up. But I don't know, maybe that's just by game changers because all the, the outperformers, they have it all figured out. Because in the end, you need to decide, are you going to drive linear change? The outperformers, they do it all well. Because here's my problem. I believe in exponential growth. I believe in rethinking things in a totally new way. So, everybody wants to hire me. The problem is, after six months, everybody wants to fire me. Because this is not working out. More expensive didn't really work. But have you set off for exponential growth? I think you need to be super honest. And what you're selling, and how you're driving change in your companies, and what you want to accomplish. Because in the end, you can feel it in your stomach. And then you say, okay, great, Jonas, you come here, you do a lot of mumbo jumbo, uh, you've never really been in a real company, you don't understand things, and I, I, I can agree with that, you know. Um, but I think Simon Simonik says it really well, you only have to answer three questions. What are you selling? Very simple. To who and how? And in the end, why are you doing it? And making money is not always the right answer. I can ask my 12-year-old son this. Philip, what are you selling? I'm selling cookies. Okay, fair enough. To who and how? I'm selling it to the people that enter the local community train every morning. Okay, fine. Seems to be a good plan. Why, Philip? Why are you doing this? Why are your cookies going to be better than Unilever's and all the other cookies in the world? And then he just looks at me and says, no, we have to because we're going on a class journey. Normal parents wouldn't give him up by then and say, okay, that's fine. Uh, but his father can't, so he goes, you know, Philip, how have you innovated in zeros in this business model? We talked about the importance about this. You can't start a business without innovating in zeros. And then he just looks at me and said, if mother buys the cookies, I make so much more. Correct, Philip, now you, first, you found your first zero. Thank you very much. That was all for me. Yeah.